Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Dr. Tony Rabello, who's going to talk to us about the uh, BioBlitz, the various BioBlitzes, one that we ran so successfully last year, the Overstrand area. It was the first time we'd entered, and we came second in the whole of the Southern Hemisphere. So we've got the wind in our sails now, and we're going for the City Nature Challenge, which is also a first for this region. So Tony Rubello has been running this. He's the sort of mastermind behind this in our naturalist. So he's really the person to tell us about the bioblitz that happened and where we're going with the City Nature Challenge. So without any further ado, let me hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm not the iNaturalist. I'm just the South African representative. iNaturalist is in, um, centered in the United States. I'll start off by con congratulating um, Overstrand. If I remember correctly, it's this one. There we are. And um, that's your contribution um, from last year and um, to the great Southern Biobits. And it's the first time you took part and you did a fantastic job. We were really impressed. A bit more of an issue this year because we're doing the City Nature Challenge, um, which is a different kettle of fish. And now we've got 20 cities from Southern Africa taking part, whereas there were only five last year. So it's really growing and, and getting um, ongoing. But before I start, I just want to take you a bit to some ancient history. When I was young and just got my degree, with my first paychecks and joined the Cape Bird Club and Botanical Society, so I, took life membership, which is really cool thinking back because it cost me all of 200 ron. It was a whole month salary, but I'm now a life member of Bob Sox. I don't have to pay subscriptions anymore, um, which is really cool. So I think it was a good investment. Um, but when I joined, the, the obvious thing is that everyone was old. I was by far the youngest member of the Botanical Society. But this raised the issue, how, how do we get more people interested in, in botany and plants and animals and, and younger people interested and, and the youth? Um, and so we started off with a project which I tried to run, um, which was the Protea Atlas project. And this ran from 1991 to 2001, 2002, um, and some of you might even remember it. And I don't know, did anyone actually take part in it? Yes, okay, fantastic, well done. So we've got people who actually not only remember it, but took part. Um, and it was a question of how do we get the public interested in nature? How do we get them out there recording as if you like, scientists and contributing to conservation and science and all the fun things that um, can happen with um, biology and with getting outdoors. And so we conceived this idea, which is actually an Australian idea. They did it on the Banks Atlas, um, and we got people to contribute. And it was quite simple. You, on your walks, you recorded what you saw, and then you transcribed it onto a form, and then you posted it. And a couple of days later, those are the good old days, it arrived at UCT and we took it out the envelope. We sent it to the UCT and um, data capturers who did the exams and everything else. They captured our data for us. They typed it up, it came back, we had to check it. And then we had to run it through the computer. And then we had to check that what you'd done was correct, that you'd done the math work and et cetera. And then we'd send you a response saying, fantastic, you've seen the King Protea at Hermanus. And, and it only took about two, three weeks to be able to tell you that. And it was a, quite a ship. You had to fill in all these paper forms. You had to post it. You had to wait. By the time you got anything back, you'd forgotten what you'd done. Plus, you had to do map work because we wanted to know where you were, where in Amman. So we had to say, we had to provide a service because not everyone could afford it. And if you wanted to go for a hike, we would send you a photocopy of the map. And on your thing, you'd record where you were um, on your map. So you had to read a map. That was a big deal. So we had to run courses to train people how to read maps. Um, and then You'd go on your hike, you'd record me. But then when you came back, it was an evening, two evenings. Sometimes people were complaining. We spent two hours hiking, but it took us two weeks to process all the data, working out where you were on the map, writing the coordinates, getting the coordinates, writing it on these sheets and transferring it. And, and then you still made mistakes. And it was in 1994, just about halfway through the project, that some guy, amateurs, amateurs are the people who run everything said, hey, there's this new GPS thing. Why don't we use GPS? So we said, fine, well, what on earth are you talking about? And we looked at that and yeah, we managed to buy for 5,000 rods in those days, which is a lot of money, a GPS. Um, and we decided to test it on Toastberg, which was a SARP meeting, so that's a botanist meeting. And we went there and um, I had to carry the GPS, which had an aerial this big. 
and a kilogram battery, and I put it in my rucksack. Between that and the food, I didn't have space for anything else in my rucksack. And we walked up the top of Daysburg and got our reading, and it took 10 minutes to get the first reading, and told us we were 200 meters higher from the mountain and about a kilometer away. And I took the second reading afterwards, and then the battery was left. So, so much for technology, we decided that um, GPS wasn't quite ready for us. Besides, the Americans were fudging it, they were hiding it because they didn't want to be able to ship missiles into their thing. So, it wasn't accurate anyway. We decided, no, this is not technology for us yet. Um, we'll have to give it a couple of years or decades to go. And then, of course, at that same time, we started getting emails. So, in the end of the project, we were sending information by emails instead of by the post office. We never got around to cameras. Some of our people discovered that the photocopier worked well, and towards the end, you could send um, pictures of the photocopiers via the email. So we had people collecting a little bit of specimens and sending it to us to help with ID, which was okay, but it was a lot of specimens, and sometimes they arrived moldy, and sometimes they crashed and were broken. And we had to have a whole team in the office of volunteers going through this, checking everything, seeing, was it a King Protein, or did you make a mistake? So it was quite a rigmarole. Cameras had just started, and there were electronic cameras, but they were so bad, you, you got very fuzzy picture, and it was a minute little picture, and it didn't work very well. And the people who were into cameras said, no ways will digital cameras ever replace the good old film, and you ran around with these little canisters of film, and if they got exposed to light, they disappeared, and you had to do them in 34, and if they were out of focus, you only found out a week later when they came back. So we were constrained by technology. And now looking back, that's, it's almost impossible to believe. We now have a cell phone, a smartphone, and everything you need is there. If we wanted to run that project today, it'd be a simple matter of saying, take your cell phone, go out there, switch it on, select the iNaturalist app, which you've downloaded before, switch it on, decide to make an observation, press the button, and take the picture you want of with the protea, that'll do. Take the picture, click send, and you're done. That is it, literally. That's how long it takes to make an observation on the smartphone today on iNaturalist, compared to the whole procedure, which was weeks, just 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We've come a long way. So it was with this technology that in, I'm trying to think what the year it was, it was in, um, we took part for the first time in 2019, but it was 2016 that two American cities, um, San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, decided that they would have a fire blitz and compete against one another using iron actions. And so it was just a matter of everybody could take their smartphones and go and take pictures of what was in their city. So it brought down the recording of animals and plants and stuff to the cities. And with the technology, it made it available to anyone. So we could get school kids to go and say, hey, on those days, just go and record it. And then in by four years, when we joined, um, there were over 100 cities taking part um, in the City Nature Challenge over four days. And it's usually in April um, and it's a weekend. And at that time, throughout the world, people in the cities will be recording what's in their city. Um, anyone can record. All you need is a smartphone and a link to iNaturalist. So that got going, and of course 2019 was our first year of joining, and we won, which is cool. We won in um, two categories, the number of observations and the number of species. And we didn't do so well in the number of observers. So uh, we, went, we were only about number eight or nine in the, the number of observers. But now it's an annual event. Last year, almost a million people we're busy on those four days recording what is in their city. So it's a great fun event. You go and record, you go and see what other cities are seeing, what people are looking at. Um, and it's a, a really great idea. And it's as simple as taking your cell phone out with your smartphone and going out and recording. So that's the City Nature Challenge. I suppose before I go on, let me just introduce you to iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a, a, a site where you can go and upload observations. As I said, you can do it straight away on your cell phone, or if you're old fashioned and have got a camera, you can use this upload button to upload your observations. Let's just look at um, what's happening in Southern Africa. We originally started off with iSpot, I should say, but we left iSpot because we had um, problems with them 
running out of money and they couldn't maintain the site properly, so we migrated to iNaturalist. So this is iNaturalist. All I've done is I've logged on to the site and I've pressed the explore button and, and it's now showing me the summary for Southern Africa. And we can see there we've got 2 million observations from Southern Africa collected by you guys of 35,000 species. I should point out that the national collection, the natural herbarium in Pretoria has 2 million specimens collected over the last 100 years. So in, I suppose you can say five years, we've done what the National Herbarium took a century to do. And we can see there 20,000 observers have contributed in Southern Africa to these observations. And it should be showing me the, where they are, but the line is a bit slow, so it hasn't populated that, but don't worry about that. But interestingly enough, we've got 11,000 identifiers. So we've got a huge amount of data um, and it's coming in all the time. What's really fun about iNatch is that when you put an observation in, um, you can get it identified. So you don't need to know what it is. You see a pretty flower, you photograph it, and it'll be identified for you, and perhaps even um, in as short as a couple of minutes. Let me just show you an example. This is the summary here. I should just point out, if you're interested in iNaturalist, that is your heading on the top. That is where your menu is, your control menu, um, and that is the link to your own data. You can see there it comes up with the drop-down of um, ways of getting to your own information. But these headings here, this one is the search. If you want to search for something, um, the explore button over there for exploring, and that's what we're using at present. Um, we're looking at the data for Southern Africa, but I just want to go and look at the grid. I want to find a nice observation so that we can just look at it. Something interesting. Um, yeah, so this is just data that's come in and recently. I'm just looking at it. Um, let's just try this one. Okay, so let's click on this one. Um, and I'm just going to use that to illustrate what an observation on iNaturalist is. Um, so this particular one is an observation. It's got a single picture, and that is our herbarium specimen. So what iNaturalist is, it's a virtual museum, a museum of pictures. Um, and that is our specimen um, for this bird. And you will see there, it's a research grade um, white brow Google. It was collected by Pestelti, which means nothing to me, but if we click on his name, um, and I'm going to use the trick of a mouse wheel click, which opens in a new tab, so I can go there and then keep, keep this page there and go there. So that's the mouse wheel click. Um, and he is Timo Estelinen, and he doesn't tell us anything about himself. So your homework tonight is if you haven't already, you need to little, put a little bio in there so that you know who you are and what your interests are. Um, and there's his data over there. We can go and look at it. We can look on the top bar there, the submenu bar, and look at his stuff. Let's just look at his observations. Um, he's done his observations in, and this is all coming from um, the servers over in California. You'll see he's worldwide. Um, I presume he's on holiday, and it looks like he's on holiday in Kruger, or in, in this case, in Mozambique. Um, and I guess he spends most of his time up in Sinai. So, um, yeah, on holiday and he's exploring biodiversity and I hope he did it properly by using iNaturalist to see what he could see. Um, so that is Escalpi. He has only done 75 observations, or you argue he's done already 75 observations. And he observed this on March the 1st um, at um, in Ambani. And there we can zoom in and we can go in and see where he observed it. Um, notice that we've got a point, but we've also got an error around the point. And what he's saying is, I was somewhere inside that um, thing. That's where I saw it. And I know I was definitely inside there. And that's one kilometer. So the accuracy is um, one kilometer radius about that he's put in. So we have a specimen. We know where it is. We know the date it was seen. And we know who saw it. And that is what a herbarium or museum specimen is. Um, except that in this case, it's a picture, not an actual specimen. We didn't have to kill the bird um, to make the specimen out of it. Okay, and then he came and he identified it as a white brow cuckoo. And then that is one hour ago that it got posted. And then 42 minutes, so a quarter of an hour afterwards, Luke Downley confirmed the ID. 
Um, and then what iNaturalist has done is it said that that is now research grade because it's been confirmed. Um, this is the community taxon summary there. Um, and we just looked over here. He hasn't joined any projects, which is a, a pain. Um, we've got to try and get him interested. These are the people who've identified the species. So if you want the experts, it's probably going to be Colin or Michael if you want to find some more information about the species. Um, and then there's a data quality assessment there, which is for the sites. Don't worry about that. Um, and then we can see those are some other of these, of these observations. So he's not only interested in birds. In fact, he seems to be more interested in butterflies. Um, and then those are other nearby observations from Bazarutu. That looks like an interesting one. Um, let's, let's go look at that one. Well, let, let's just finish with this one. Um, so there we are. Um, if we didn't have an ID, we should get an ID. And it's very simple. You go into the suggest an ID identification box and you put your cursor inside that box. And iNaturalist then matches the picture up against its picture library and says, this is what it is. And it says that it's pretty sure it's in the genus Centropus and it's almost certain that it's Centropus superciliosus. So this is an example of artificial intelligence. They have a library collection and they run their magic. And if you take a photo, it will go look in that collection and say, ah, that's what it is, okay? And for us, it's great. Um, we can use it to identify um, a species. Uh, it's not so great when they're using it for surveillance and Big Brother and checking what we're doing. And, but it allows them to identify people and do all sorts of things. In the case of iNaturalist, it's for identifying species, which is cool. So that's it. And iNaturalist now is really superb. We need 100 observations before we can train the artificial intelligence. So any observation that doesn't have 100 observations won't be in the library. But anyone that's got more than 100, um, it will probably identify and will probably identify far faster than I can and far more accurately than I can. So, um, yeah, I think I know my plants very well. Um, but I will defer to the artificial intelligence for, for the more common species um, because it's just so brilliant. Um, I could also have, if I'd known any of the English name, I could have just typed in white, Google, and I now just would then have gone through the dictionary and found the matches and there's the white cloud Google. On our naturalist, to select something, you must always click. So um, that's another way of doing an ID. If you know what it is, you can go and, and search it. Um, we use the artificial intelligence. And if you want to do it the comparison way, there is a compare option and you can click the compare button um, and it will open up the tool that allows you to ID. Now, in this case, it was identified as this. So it's suggesting that it's in the genus and it's suggesting that it's in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. Let's just make the area a bit bigger and go for the whole of Mozambique. So in the whole of Mozambique, there are um, two, three, three species of kukul. The black kukul, um, Senegal kukul, and the white brown kukul. And so it's a matter of matching up your picture. We can enlarge the picture if we need to. Uh, and then match up your picture against this. Is it this one or is it that one? Um, or is it that one? Um, and we've gone for white browed, and which is that one. Um, just looking at it, I would say that's more likely, isn't it? The Senegal one, where is it recorded? It's not recorded at Pasaruja at all, whereas this one is. So there's historical records of um, the white browed over here, and the Senegal has not been recorded on the coast of, um, and the, the black one is. Um, in that area. Um, so I need to just go back when I go home and I'll just check and make sure on my ID, I'll get my books out and, and check the ID. But I've um, put that down as the, as the ID now. So now it's got three and it's research grade. So iNaturalist is not just about using the public to get data. It's also about using the public to do identifications. And in fact, it uses the public to actually write the program that I'm behind it and to curate the dictionary and all that other work. It's all citizen scientists, it's all volunteers. So it's a full on volunteer program. Um, so that's the tool that we're using, iNaturalist. Um, and it's this that we use for the Great Southern Biopets. Now the City Nature Challenge, which I told you about is cool. It's run in April, May every year, but it's a real dumb time for us. It's nothing flowering. It's the worst possible time that we could take part in this. But of course, it's the Northern Hemisphere thing. They're getting into spring, they're Easter, everything is blooming, everything is 
breeding, everything, and it's great fun. Whereas we're sitting and we're competing with them um, without going into autumn, everything shutting down, everything slowing down. Um, so it's a bit of an unfair um, competition, which is why the Australians came up with the great southern violets, um, which you took part in last year for the first time and did really well. So, yep, there we are. There was your project. That's the project you ran to, um, to run it. Um, and that's just a summary of your data. So the person who contributed most was Chris Whitehouse and then Linky, and you can see other people there. Um, and the person who saw the most species was Chris Whitehouse. He saw 551 species and Linky saw 422. Linky is a traitor. She's supposed to be in Cape Town. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, she's contributing to the thing. We'll see what she does for the Nature Challenge. Um, and then the most observed species was Mimidis cuculatus and Crassula vespicularis and Edmondia Um, We can find out more about them if we want. Um, and here we can see 14,000 observations and you managed to get 52% um, of them identified to research grade, which is very, very good. Um, and the important thing to notice in this project is that you made use of the journal. And that's probably the contributed to your success because the journal allows you to communicate with your members and saying, hey, these are the events we're having. Come join us in these events. This is the fun this stuff we're going to do. And then afterwards, you can tell them, please help with the IDs and various other things. So yeah, and that's where your data came from. That's the area you um, are busy in. Um, and we will um, just look at that in a little bit more detail uh, later. But now, and we're gearing up for the, oh, I told you, that's the one I clicked. That's the daemon, eh? Cool. So that's one of the whip spiders. And probably glad we don't get them there because it's about this big across. Wow. So you know, it's a really nice size things. But yeah, it's one of these things. And you should have been able to get an ID if we press the compare button. Um, there's been no records from there. But if we look at Mozambique, um, there's Brachialis. Oh, so that's why they didn't, haven't decided. They can't decide whether it's Brachialis or very large. Um, and I'd have to go to my books to find out. Because you can see they look very, very similar. So, okay, so that's why it's not been identified to species. But someone will do that soon. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to go to your, this one. So that was the Great Southern Bardlets, which we ran. Um, let's see, why have you got the Great Southern Bardlets already? Obviously, Nature Challenge, sorry. I just need to change that. Um, why do you really set up your Bardlets? That's only in October. You've got the City Nature Challenge to do first. Um, <laughs> yeah, you far too far off the bar. Okay, good. This is what we're talking about. The City Nature Challenge 2022. Please diarize the dates. So it's the end of the month. So everybody here from Friday the 29th to May the 2nd, you are going to be out there having fun, going to your open spaces, your parks, your nature reserves. Um, and have you organized any divers yet? You need someone in the sea. If you're going to compete with Cape Town, you need divers out there. You need to go and get some people to get in the water and to take some of that magnificent stuff that's living there underwater. Um, and yeah, um, anywhere else, um, in Fernturf, in Pochelgat, in Mansgenkop, Babylon Sturen, Harold Porter, get the kids to go and play in Harry Potter. Um, everything, anything, and we need to go out there and record. And you can see that is in 24 days, 24 and a half days time, and we'll all be doing it. And the journal is active. And um, so, yeah, you need to know what's happening. And to know what's happening, your homework after you've done your bio this, um, this evening or this afternoon is to please go and join this project. We can see 32 people have joined the project. We want a couple of hundred, perhaps even a thousand. I don't know. What's your target? How many people are you hoping to get for this event? You must get a target and you must aim for it. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has to be a realistic target. Yeah. <laughs> 500. No, 500 is fantastic. How did you do? How many did you do for the? Um, you did 177 for the pilots. So 500, that's a reasonable target. Go for it. 
And so, yeah, you need a target also for the number of species and the number of observations you're going to do. But cool. So if you want to be informed as to what's happening in the journal, and then um, you need to join this project. And then every time they update the journal, it will appear on your dashboard um, and you'll be able to see what's happening. It won't email you or anything unless you've asked for it. Um, you're going to have to come and look at um, the City Nature Challenge, um, this page um, on our naturalist to get that journal information. Um, do you have a Facebook page for the event? Um, sorry, that's a question. Do you have a Facebook page for the event? Yes, okay. So the Facebook page is probably what you'll interact with more um, for the events and stuff. But the journal is where um, it'll be summarized and keep you informed as to what progress and what's happening. Okay, so um, you need to join the project. That's your homework for this evening. So, and this is the City Nature Challenge. The other one was the Great Southern Bioblitz. And they are both bioblitzes. Now, what on earth is a bioblitz? A bioblitz is an event where you get people to go out to a place and record what they see. And you can do it in two ways. They can go and record everything, and you just go and you have and see what you can do in the shortest possible time or in a particular time. Or you can bring a couple of experts together and say, um, this bioblitz will be for drinking monkey beetles, and we'll go to Ferncliff or Harry Porter, um, and we will um, look for monkey beetles there, and we'll record them all and put them on our naturalist, and then we'll have invite an expert on monkey beetles to come and show us monkey beetles at Harry Porter. But then at the same time, once it's on there, the experts all around the world will be contributing the IDs and saying, hey, great, this is what they've seen, and you'll get feedback that way. So that's what a bioblitz is. It's a, an event where people go out and explore nature or some facet of nature, and usually in the um, consultation with your amateurs and your specialists and your experts, um, and, and they have a fun event around it. And it can be as short as an hour, or it can be, in this case, four days. So, um, yes, the Overstrand, I'm sure, will be organizing lots of bioblitz. And we're organizing a couple of night walks in Cape Town. So some night activities to go look for spiders. Or chameleons. Chameleons, the easiest way to see chameleons is to go with the torch at night, because um, there it's dark, they can't see, so they go neutral color and they go white. So when you shine a light on them, they're white. They're not camouflaged at all, and you can see them easily. Or use a light and attract moths um, to a sheet of, and then you can record all the moths. It's a quick way of getting lots of moths. So if, there's all sorts of tricks and there's all sorts of fun things you can do. And yeah, you can go on a safari in your garden. You'll be surprised at the amount of hojas and stuff there are in your, amongst your roses and in your other stuff, just as long as you don't use too much poison. So um, yeah, those are all different types of bioblitz, and you organize the event and you get people to go. Um, and get involved in them. So, yeah, well done to the Overstrand for um, doing so well last year, and we'll see how you're going to do um, this year. Um, so you've got a whole lot of events organized and stuff, but how do you find out what you want to do or what you particularly interested in? Say you decide you're going to take part in this um, Bioblitz. Well, I know this is your answer. Um, go in, log in. I'm going to log in, and it goes to my dashboard. Um, that's not so important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the explore button um, and I'm going to say, okay, um, find me. Um, I'm going to use the search button rather. So, so for some of you, it might be hidden behind the button, just open it up and I'm going to search for print blue. And um, there we are, Fern Cliff. It's giving me a few things. Let me just view them all. Um, so that's the Fern Cliff Nature Reserve. That's a place. And this is the Friend Cliff Nature Reserve that is a project. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. So let's click on Friend Cliff. Um, and it's now giving me the project for Friend Cliff, um, which is cool. Um, there we've got 8,000 observations, almost 1,000 species. Maybe you'll be able to get them up to 1,000 species in the Biobits camp. Uh, let's see if we can do that. Um, and those are the observations, and then if we just go down there, there's the map of Ferncliff Nature Reserve, and that's the observations in the map, and which is really nice. And so good coverage, you know, I presume it's over a whole lot of years, um, but I'm not interested in everything, I'm only interested in some stuff. So I'm going to um, go to observations and use the search button, there's the search button underneath there, and click on search, um, which would have been exactly the same if I had gone to explore and then use the filters, 
So in iNaturist, you can do everything in lots of ways. And here, I would have put in Sunflip Nature Reserve as the project. So there we are. That's Sunflip Nature Reserve. There's my search. There's that. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what species might occur there. What can I see if I go to Sunflip Nature Reserve? And there we are. Those are the 905 species. The most commonly recorded one is a Drosera. Why a sundew? That's interesting. Okay. Followed by, yes, I can understand the Cape Everlasting. It's quite pretty in Alex and Erika um, Longifolia. That's old Erika Longifolia. And the Salters, yeah, thin cushion, another. You've obviously got a few sundew, really keen sundew people in this area. But notice that plants are by far the dominant um, things in the Ferncliffe Nature Reserve. Um, if you want to go see something other than plants, perhaps it's not um, that good. But I'm interested in birds. What birds are there in the Fern Cliff Nature Reserve? I'm going to go to the filter and I'm going to filter on birds. Update the search. So what birds might I see if I go to Fern Cliff? Um, it says no results. No birds. Are there no birds in Fern Cliff? <laughs> <laughs> that, that that is fascinating okay okay good okay let me just then if that's the case i'm going to have to well it's an open slate i can go there and record all the birds any bird i record will be um unrecorded on iNaturalist on, on um let's just look at another nature reserve um what is called Kurtbos, is it that's in your area Kurtbos private nature reserve um update search let me look at what birds on perhaps they've got some birds and there we are okay and not that many only five but yes it's the cape sugar bird and the drongo and the weaver um yeah so they've got some birds there which is a, a marked improvement on fern bird. <laughs> now, now i'm curious what's harry yeah porter's birds look like sorry i'm just gonna sorry sorry <laughs> harold porter do they have any birds Type in Harry Porter, there it is, that found the match. Um, click on update search. It's still, I've still got the filter on birds. See there, it's still on birds. Um, and yeah, yeah, okay, now we've got a far more better looking set of birds. So 22 records of Bromerob Scafa. And are any of the specials on? The ones that the, the guys come all around the world to see. The Victor and Scrub Warbler, there we are. That's one of the real specials from the real rarities. Um, and the striped fluff tail, yeah. So yeah, so the people are coming all around the world to, to see these rare species. It's the cake rock junk there, yeah. Um, oh, I expected to see the cape rock jump. Yeah, but it hasn't been photographed there yet. Okay, well there's 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 something that someone can go find. Okay, so th th that just gives an example. So say we were going to go to a place, um, it's just an arbitrary place. I'll, I'd hit explore to, to open up the, the map for me. I'd zoom into where I wanted to be, which of course is going to be over strand somewhere. Um, and let's just look at, for argument's sake, the um, train refill lagoon. Okay, so I've got it on my map. I'm looking at it. I can click this button, redo the search on the map. Um, and it will now get all the records in that area on the map. We can zoom out now. See, it's just inside the map. So it's around the crane play. And now we can look at what species are there. Um, and you right, can see the birds feature strongly. There's a whale. Um, so not birds. Plants feature strongly. There's a whale. Are there any birds? <laughs> ah, there's a, a gamma. And there's a dassy. Yes, okay. So, so you guys are obviously into your plants, which is cool. Thank you. There's the, there's the frog. Um, and the raucous toad and the angular tortoise, um, yeah, and marine birds. Um, yeah, I suppose I should be focusing on the plants. Uh, <laughs> um, it depends where. So in Australia, the birders are heavily on time. Yeah, so two birds. So we need to get them involved. So there we are. That's one target group. That we need to tow. We need to get the bird people involved in the screen nature challenge. Um, I was just looking on um for Cape Town. Let, let me mm, let me just show you. 
It was a project that somebody suggested, an extra limit all. And so I created this project yesterday. Um, and it's about birds that aren't supposed to be in Cape Town, but they've moved into Cape Town in the last 100 years on their own, not with people bringing them. So it's not the house crows or the, or the um, starlings or the Indian miners. It's the ones that came in on their own. Um, and um, it's these 20 species. So the Hardy Dar, 1984, it crossed the um, Hottentots Holland. That was the first time it was in Cape Town. And Numida and the guinea fowl that was brought in in the 1930s. And the red-eyed dove um, wasn't common. It was here, yeah, but they brought in the Madagascar, not Madagascar, the Mozambique race um, to Algin. And it hybridized, and then suddenly the species spread like mad. And then this black orb-web spinner, that's a new one. It's only been there for about 10 years in Cape Town. And I've added the species because it's spreading like mad uh, on its own. So these are just some examples. And the fun thing is that um, if we look at these um, records here, um, the Swee Wax Bull and the, where's the mannequin? Bronze mannequin. Uh, what's the bronze mannequin look like? There we are, bronze mannequin, that guy. There's hardly any records in the bird club. So it's more recorded on iNaturist than, than the bird is. So, and that's a case of, it's interesting, and people are finding in their gardens and don't know what it is, and they can't find it because it's not supposed to be kept down. So they pop it on an iNaturist and get the idea on iNaturist. Whereas the more common species, people are taking these fancy, beautiful pictures and they're posting it on all the um, big websites. So, so I think that's the big difference. Um, but so um, 95 records of this mannequin in Cape Town, and there's only about six records on the bird atlas. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting that even though we don't focus on birds, we focus on plants here, um, the guys in the gardens, the people who are interested in small stuff are, and, and they don't know their stuff so well, the amateurs are involved on in iNaturalist. So, so we need to get them, we need to harness them, and we need to get them and going on the thing. So that's just an example of how we can use um, iNaturalist to find out uh, things. And if you're interested in a particular group like um, Protea, um, rather than the whole, all plants, we can then go and see in that area, which is that area now, I can't remember. Let's just look on the map again. Uh, that was the area around the lagoon there. Yes. Uh, and the proteas, there's 16, 16 species of protea that have been found there. Um, and this protea repens the king, the black bearded. And you can see there what's there. Now, of course, the, the thing that we're really interested in from the point of view of the bioblitz and the city nature challenge are the ones that aren't there the ones that haven't been seen. Um, and so that requires a little bit more homework um, and it requires our coordinators to go and to check species that haven't been recorded and find out about them. Now, if Overstrand is going to win, um, let's just look at the results for, um, where's my results? The results for Southern Africa. And um, this is for the um, Great Southern Biobits that you did. We'll see there, Cape Town came tops followed by Overstrand, and then Garden Root, and then Etiquene, Durban. And then um, Pretoria, Shwane, um, was over there. And then we did the whole of Zimbabwe as a country. This year we've got Bulawayo is competing with Harari. And they're going to compete against one another for fun. So, yeah, Overstrand was there, 14,000 observations, 21 for Cape Town, and Garden Root was half of Overstrand. So, um, that was a surprise. You came out of nowhere. We've always thought that Garden Root going to be number two. Um, so well done. And then in terms of species, um, Overstrand, you know, it's the garden root almost had as many species. That shouldn't be. I could have got a huge area. They, they're cheating. We look at their project. Um, we look at their project. They're doing the whole of the Karoo. I mean, that's their city. Okay. So, so they, they should be able to get lots of species. On the other hand, this is the heart of the Cape Frog Kingdom. You, you've got Kuchelberg and you've got Crane and a few mountains. You guys should be winning the hands down. So yeah, and oh, of course you did. Um, you, you showed us there with that. So and, thing, and then if we look at the number of observers, um, we had 300, you had 170 on the garden route, and we expected the garden route to have more, um, and 170. Um, now, the reason why we've got so many is because we're using scouts. So we've got scouts. You've got one scout group here in Hermanus? 
And are there any other scouting guide groups? So try and get them involved. And um, there is a badge for scouting, um, and they can compete then with the other scouting groups in the Western Cape. So and this year there are five cities in 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 Southern Africa. Do I have that one? Um, no, I don't. No, I don't have that one to hand. Let me just see if you've done it. Um, if we just read here, that should link to it. Um, no, you've just gone for the total one. Well, okay, I'm just going to um, 22 Southern Africa. Yeah, I had this all set up on my, my computer. It's not that difficult to do. As you can see, it's quite easy to navigate around INAT. Just, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, um, we want um, the City Challenge 2022 um, Southern Africa. And it should, there we are, Southern Africa, that's what it is. Um, so this year we've got a lot more cities, 19, I think it's gone up to 20 now. Um, and that's them in alphabetical order, but that's where they are. And we can just zoom in on them. So this year in Cape Town, we have the West Coast, we've got Cape Town, we've got Stellenbosch, we got over strand and over bird. So, and those are, and of course, garden route. So we've got a whole lot here. So scouts on all of these will be competing and guides as well will hopefully be competing against, uh, well, not competing against, uh, contributing, going out there and enjoying themselves, going into nature reserves, um, recording plants and animals and anything fungi, anything they see, and um, going on night um, hikes and um, trapping moths, um, going out into the water, into the rivers. And, and the sea to look for stuff. So yeah, so that's your reason. You're probably one of the smallest regions. Stellenbosch is a bit smaller. Um, and then notice um, Cape Town is also cheating. We have those tours that go to these canyons to see those marine birds. So we've extended ourselves, uh, we've got permission. We've extended ourselves out to there. So that adds about 20, 30 species to our total. Um, if the weather is good and if the um, fishing boats are going. So, um, Let's just, um, uh, yeah, let's just um, look here for the Overstrand region. Um, can I click on there? Yeah. So that's you for this year. Um, that's the area. And you need to get somebody in the marine side. And you can see it goes over um, the Klein Rafi Mountains. Um, it includes Babylon's Tourum. Um, and then um, Fernclough, Fokkelkat, and it goes up just to Manskenkop. It doesn't go over Manskenkop. But then you've got Kuchelberg, and you go over to Bot River. It would be nice to get data from Bot River, but this area is now a spotter camp. And it's no longer safe, which is an absolute pain. But yeah, if we can get into this area here, say, um, this pass over here, um, and get stuff done. Let's see what you did last year. Um, I'm going to go into there and just... Um, Just zoom in to what you did. Just look at the area. So this is your data from the last year's Southern Bioblitz. And you can see where people concentrated. Um, it's in the urban areas, of course. Um, and then people did the trails um, at um, Odebos and up there. Um, unfortunately, Harry Potter was closed because of the fire. They were repairing the path. Do you know if those paths are fixed now? Can you go up there? Yeah. So yeah, so we need some work up there. Um, but what's a big miss missing is the Highlands Trail. Um, that nobody did that. And um, where does it go? You can see it running there. Um, yeah, that's the Highlands Trail. There, nobody did that. Um, Three Sisters was done nicely. Chainmont was done and great. Um, the only the bird people went to the sleigh. Um, hardly any plant activity at the play, and then nothing in um, what's the school fisher haven? Yeah, no, no, no. hardly any data there, um, and then some nice data from Hermanus, lots of data from Fernclough. Um, you didn't go up here, so you didn't get the Mimetes palustris, but you need to know where that is. You're not going to find it if you don't. It's, it's not flowering, so it's can be hard to see. 
some nice data from Fuhu Cut, and then um, you had Philip Scope, that was obviously Chris. Um, he did that work over there. And then perhaps you need to get script also a little bit more involved. They've got those ranges and those guys, there a little bit more data there. Um, and no one went to these forests here. Isn't this supposed to be Seltus Forest or something? Yeah? Magic Forest or something? Yeah. yeah, okay, that's an area. Um, and then I see someone was very strategic and, and did these transects. That's very clever um, for getting your species numbers up. So if you do these transects up here into the limestone, you get those special limestone species and stuff. Um, so that's cool. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'd say one of the big missings is the marine side, having people diving and going in and recording all those um, cockos. And then another thing I noticed from your, um, I could try and find you into your project. We've got too many of them open now, sorry. Um, your, that's ours, that's, that's the bad, let's, no, it was a garden root, not interested in there. So I just have to try and get you again. I'll find you by sticking on there. That's the easiest way. Um, so those are your contributions. And the other thing we do um, on, um, on City of Cape Town is to get people when they're making IDs or when they post stuff to mark stuff as favorites. Um, and um, these are the favorites from your, from your blitz. I'm going to redo them in a more acceptable way by clicking on the observations and doing the search. So I'm just doing the same thing, except I'm using the search button, but now I can order it by the faves. So by faves. So now they're ordered by faves um, and then I look in the group. So these were your faves. And the one that got the most faves was this river frog with this little um, bit of foam around it. Followed by some other plants. Erica coulter. Do you know Erica coulter? It's one that grows in solid limestone in the cracks in the solid limestone cliffs. So just over there, um, is there a picture? Yeah. So it grows in the solid limestone. So it's a, a real cool one to try and get. And I presume it got saved then because I mean, it's, it's such a rare and interesting species. Um, I think you can do, oh, there's your. Rock jumper. So it's more, it was one of the phases of the of the competition. That's in Saint Cliff. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, these are just an example of space. Now we use that in Cape Town to decide on who did the best observation of, of the competition, and we have a couple of things and like that. And of course, we then use the observers to say that um, Chris Whitehouse did the most and Linky did the most. They disqualified because they almost professionals. So um, who's the person who did the most, who deserves the most credit or whatever? No, but Chris did a great job, there's no doubt about that. Um, and then you can look at the species, who saw the most species, and it's Chris and Linky. So we can go there. And in Cape Town, we would then give prizes. So um, for this year, we're hoping to get um, a weekend away in West Coast National Park um, for, the, for the person who does the most, um, excluding a couple of people who work in the city. Um, but um, for the person who contributes the most. So, so we give prizes and that gets the people interested in going. Um, and for our faves, um, there's nothing. And um, these were for the City Nature Challenge in 2019. Um, that was the winning fave. Um, and that's another thing. Cape Nature must have cameras out there. Night cameras and stuff. And if you've got people who've got cameras, go and find spots that you like to get things like art fire, porcupine and stuff. Put them out, put out. And then you've got the week afterwards to upload. So that you can leave them out for the whole competition and bring them in and bring in these. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if I've got his name. Um, I forget his name, but um, we can identify him by spots. And he's the dominant male in the Halderberg Basin. Um, I don't know if he's still there, but certainly for that event, he was there and he came and he performed beautifully for that. Um, our number two picture was this one by Gigi Laidler. Um, of the um, otter, um, and then number three was by uh, Machrit, who of course is now defected and is in your city, <coughs> but then she was in ours, and yeah, she loves these hawkers and breeding the hawkers and stuff, so she had this 
bit of a one of the um, ladybird eating the aphids. And there you can see it's actually eating. So a nice one showing an interaction as well. And then, um, yeah, um, all sorts of stuff there. So, so by getting people to fade stuff, um, one encourages people to actually look through the pictures and to discover fun stuff. Um, and here's an example. Um, this is a larder of a fiscal shrine. And there's a tortoise. So um, caught by the thing. So there we are. Um, so those are the those are some of the ways of getting people more involved. So not only can they go out and they're fun, but when the stuff comes in, um, they can do the um, phase and, and then you can use that to decide who actually produced the, the best picture um, and perhaps have an award for the best picture. So those are other ways of getting getting people involved. Um, it doesn't stop. Um, where's your thing? Got too many things open. It doesn't stop on the 2nd of May um, because that's when the fun stops and the work begins. So we've got a week, um, seven days. Um, it might be 10 days. It's May the 10th. Um, it's seven days um, to identify everything. Now, of course, if you're going to go for the number of species, you need to go and have identifications. So what I recommend is that on the four days in which you're recording, you just go out there and have fun. You just photograph everything and you load it up um, and you leave the IDs to afterwards. And then afterwards is when you do the identification parties. And you can do them now with Zoom, which is really cool. But in the first year we did before Zoom, before COVID, yeah, we didn't have Zoom before COVID, did we? <laughs> Um, we actually had parties where we got everybody in the room and we'd have the marine people with George Branch and Charlie Griffiths there and we'd have the plant people with John Manning and the people in that corner of the room and then they'd sit and they'd do IDs and other people would come and help them and bring them stuff and show them stuff. And, um, so it's a, yeah, it's a great way of getting people together and think, like, you can do it just as well on Zoom. Um, and then you need to do your IDs and you know, 14,000, 50,000 IDs is a lot to do. But there's a fantastic tool on iNaturalist that allows you to do it. And that's the identify tool. Um, and oh, I should have shown you rather. Um, yes, you can use that identify there, but, and that's the wrong one. Where is your project from last year? Let me just, um, sorry. Um, is this yours? Um, I just want to go to the, to the actual project there. Uh, um, the actual project, if you, if you go to the observations um, tab, observations tab, there's the identify button there. And that's the same as clicking this identify button and then setting it to overstand. So if we click the identify button, it opens up the curation tool for identification. And that's really cool. We can really speed up the identification process. Um, and what we do in Cape Town is we post stuff in the journal saying, click this link and identify these ones. So the, the first round you've got to do is you've got to try and get them into your genus or family. Um, and then you go to the filter box there and you filter out the ones which haven't been identified yet. Um, where's the button to go? Update search. And they are the ones that have got no identifications at all. And your idea here is to try and get people to take this and to put it down to family level idea. But if they can't, then plant is okay. But try and get the identification right now. Now, these here are problematic. They've all been identified, and I can see what the problem is already. Let's just open this one. This is someone who's made the mistake of, instead of posting four observations, they've posted all four observations onto the same observation. So all four species. Now, I just can't cope with that. It can only identify one species per observation. So we've got to ask these people to please separate these observations. And so it's important that you tell people taking part, please just go and check in the week afterwards and see if there's any messages for you. And if there's a message, just um, try and fix it up. So you've lost three observations here because this person um, done it. And th this is not bad. I've seen 20 different species on an observation. Um, so it just gets identified as thing. But so the first cut is to go on this tool and to do the um, stuff. And then you start giving it to your specialist. So if you're interested in birds, and just go and click on birds. Um, what birds need identifying? Um, and there we are, those are the birds which need identifying. So you see people can do nests, they can do the birds, they can do interactions between the birds. 
Um, and I don't think you've got any feathers. There's a dead bird. Um, you have, and bird sounds. You can do sounds and animals. Yes. yes. And you can see um, people have more difficulty identifying sounds than and they do um, the pictures. And um, so that's the next level um, where you do that. Um, and then the next level is you want them to get to a search grade. Um, and then I'm not going to show you which buttons to do to, to work there because that's your coordinator's job. They will post it in the journal um, and you will have the link in the journal. I've lost the journal, sorry. You will have the link in the journal that you tick on and you can go and help them. And, and if they're part of the identification party, that'll be part of the, of the process. So the identifications are important, but they're not as much fun and they're not as important as getting the observations because you don't have an observation, you can't identify. Okay, so we're giving up for the City Nature Challenge 2022 and I've lost your page. Um, I'll just type it in again. <laughs> Anyway, we're giving up for it and we're looking forward to seeing what you're going to do. Uh, I'm sure you're going to do as brilliant as last time and get some really fun and interesting observations. Um, try and target some of the species you haven't got. Um, so did you get the marsh rose last year? No? Okay. And my mate is the carry. I, I, you need to get a couple of experts and, and sneak them in to go and, and get those really rare species. And then the more common species, you need to the school kids and the stuff and get your schools involved and get everyone involved. And you guys, I hope you'll take part. Um, we're expecting a million people over those four days throughout the world to be doing exactly the same, going in their cities, recording what it is, popping it up there, and you can go and see what they're finding in New York or Brussels or wherever else you're interested in. So it's a real cool event. Um, and I hope I'll see you there and in the parties afterwards. Thank you. Are there any questions, anybody? Um, I would just like to say that BirdLife Africa are quite active in this area in terms of bird counts on the estuaries. There's what they call the quack count, which we do, and as the Hermans Bird Club, we involved in that. A quack count is a coordinated water bird count done on a quarterly basis. So Clane River Estuary is uh, measured, in fact, interestingly, on the date, one of the dates over this four day period, we do a, a count on the estuary. This is more of a comment than a question. I was going to ask the question of the dates, but we've got that now. And uh, I'll see if we can get the bird club involved. Uh, certainly, we're in excess of 50 species, 50 different species on the water birds alone, but in the greater Hermanus area, not specifically fernies. Our bird list uh, and checklist runs at over 200. So, you know, we would rate for that on those particular days. It's a question of how many birds you see. And uh, in a single day's outing, we're lucky to see uh, 50 to 60 different species, yeah. maybe more. This time of the year is not ideal from a point of view that many of the birds, the migrants have already left. But uh, there are some very interesting birds. You highlighted the the rock jumper, one really sought after bird that we have uh, in Fernfuf Nature Reserve is the Victorin's warbler. A little bird that size, very distinct call, but very difficult to see. And guys come from all over to try and identify and see, get a, a lifer of Victorin's warbler. So yes, I think there is potential and we can contribute towards that from the bird club point of view. No, thank great, you, Tony. Tony. Looking forward to it. Yes, and thank yeah, you. Don't forget your sewage works. It's the wrong time of the year, the, this one. So what we're doing in Cape Town is we're using this one to get publicity and to get numbers up, to get people interested. And then the Southern Bybirds one, and thing, that's when we try and get the species numbers up. When the migrants are here and all the plants are in flower and the spring flowers are out, that's, so yeah, we focus on the um, species and the monitoring in spring and the getting public involvement at the time of the year. So to try and get societies to up their membership, and that sort of stuff. Okay, so the question for the Zoom viewers is that, is it an optimal size for the group? And is a big group better or a smaller group? And that depends on, on, on what you're doing and how you do it. So um, if you're going to go and do a trail, for instance, um, and everyone's going to walk the same trail, 
then everyone can't photograph um, the same things over and over again. So there, there you want a small group of five to 10 people, and then you decide you photograph that, you photograph that or whatever. Um, but if you're going to go and explore an area um, and send groups out all over the place, then a big group is fine and you split them up into groups of three or four or five and you let them go out and explore. And if you're looking for something like um, hojas in a river, then having 10, 15 people sifting through and finding the hojas and then bringing it through. So then lots of people are, are handy. But yeah, so it's a matter of strategy. You, you don't want everyone to be in phone cliffs um, on the weekend. You want them to be at Fred Force and Hans Bay and Harry Porter. So organize several events. And then, yeah, you, um, if, if you get five to 20, that's cool. If, if you get too many, then split them up into different groups and go and walk on different routes. Yeah. What iNaturalist says as an observation is of a species by a person. So in theory, all 20 of you could photograph that same thing. If it's a real special species, so the victim scrub warbler, if the victim scrub warbler is sitting there singing in front of everyone, then everyone's going to be photographing it. Everyone will want to be on iNaturalist, that we understand. And you'd want to. But if it's just singing in the background, then one person recording it would be enough. Yes, I think Oswald Cop is uh, an important area to get to, yes. Yeah. Some, a lot of nice species up there. So yeah, a, a small blitz group. What we do is we have two different groups, the one group that goes out and gets people involved in numbers, and then we've got a sneak group that goes through and does the species. And, and it goes through the rare species that we don't want people to know about and just records them, yeah. And then iNaturalist, I should have told you, iNaturalist obscure species that are collectibles. So if people are going to poach them, um, iNaturalist automatically obscures them. So you can't get the actual localities for those species. Um, and that's crucial. We're having major poaching of our succulents. Um, and California's got the same problem with their cacti. So it's a, it's a worldwide problem. So iNaturalist um, has been designed to deal with it. But so the question is, um, is it possible to do a highland shell because it's closed after the fire? And I'd say, um, go to the reserve manager and ask for special permission to leave a small group, say five, 10, not more than that, and then go and do it. And ask for permission and then and then try and focus long time yeah but try and focus on orchids the, the spring after a fire for orchids is amazing if you're a keen botanical group you want to be friends with the reserve manager and you want to get special permission to go in and look at the orchids definitely yeah no, no, don't don't say it's closed we can't go in make a plan yes yeah, so the cape nature is just as keen to know what species are out there as you are and um, they just worried about people getting lost or injuring or falling off the path or Stealing, poaching. Yeah. So that if, if they're happy that you're not going to get lost and you're not going to poach, they'll let you in. I mean, can I ask you a question? You want indigenous plants only or exotics as well? Okay, so the City Nature Challenge is about wild things. So it doesn't matter if they're exotic or alien or whatever. If they're wild, um, it's interested. But then in Cape Town, we've taken the attitude, if we leave out all the plant stuff, then there's no trees. But we need to know what trees are in the city and where they are and where they're doing well. And the polyphagus shuttle borer beetle, which is coming in and wiping them out, we need to know where that is. So yes, we count them as well. But the emphasis is on wild things and stuff. So the butterflies in your garden, that's wild. The aphids in your garden, that's wild. And the weeds in your garden, they're wild and they count. And if you throw in the odd tree in the stuff, yes, that's great. And just don't put down your whole sucking in collection, each one in a little bit. Yeah. Don't, don't put them all on. <laughs> we had that in Cape Town. We had someone who uploaded uh, 150 species of um, rare succulents that he, that from a collector's garden. Yeah, so it was a bit embarrassing because we don't need to cheat. So wild stuff, preferably. If it's planted, just mark it as planted. And you need to turn your GPS on on your phone. Yes, if you're using your smartphone with iNaturalist, and iNaturalist will tell you if your GPS is off and you need to switch it on. So it's part of the app. And once you've set it on for the app, the app will remember next time and will always use the GPS. So the GPS is, is there, yeah. And then when you take the picture and just keep a notice on it, it tells you that it's accurate to 100 meters, accurate to 10 meters, accurate to five meters. Don't save it when it's only accurate to five kilometers because then it doesn't know where you were. Yeah. So if you take two pictures, that's never an issue. But the first picture every time of the day um, is generally vague. It takes a while to figure out where you are. Sometimes it takes up to 30, 30 seconds to figure out where you are. But yeah, so the GPS is automatic. Okay, that's um, do you want local plants only or exotics? Um, we want both, but mark the exotics. Uh, no, 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 I'll reset. Mark the planted ones as planted. Um, exotics, if they are wild, the acacias and the wattles and the pines, please record them. Um, and especially if you find new ones. 
So in the City Nature Challenge last year, we got two new species of alien at Takai. We caught it for the first time. You see anything you don't know, take a picture. Thank you. That really was, for most of us, an entirely new experience. I never knew this, this website existed. And all the, all the work that's being done by an army of volunteers. I, one of my first questions was going to be, who sponsors all this? But the answer is that it is all voluntary. All the way through, all the way from America to here. Um, yes, it's voluntary, but the problem is that it costs money. There's all that space needs to be, so all, yeah. these, all these stuff are taking space, all the computer stuff. Yes. So the, the California Academy of Sciences, it sponsors the computers and stuff, but then there's volunteers, you can volunteer money if you want to make donations, so that's the right word. So you can make donations. It costs a couple of thousand dollars per minute to store all that information. So, and yeah, we're coming in, it was um, 20 million observations made this year. That's a lot of pictures that have to be stored. Yeah. And they're yeah. stored in the cloud, but it does cost. So it's the Californian Academy of Sciences. On today. the bottom of the page, if you want to know. There we are. Thank you very much. Pleasure. That was fantastic.